welcome to Things You Don't Know. This is going to be a very interesting podcast. It's one of Dr. Deneen's favorite topics here. So what is the topic, Dr. Deneen? Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Today's topic will take the cover off of a lesser known First World War intrigue. The outcome of this event ultimately had a a dramatic impact on the world's future. If this event had happened the way Imperial Germany wanted, they could have won the war before the United States ever got involved. If that had happened, my friends, the world would be a very different place even a hundred years later to this day. Most of the world has never heard of these three uprisings, but they almost moved the planet off its axis. Oh, really? I do find that a bit Hard to believe, perhaps. If these events are so important, how come they're so unknown? Well, that can be chalked up into how history is taught in the USA. We tend to believe, somewhat arrogantly, that our own country's story is the most important. So European history is taught in relation to America rather in, than in the context in which the events occurred. I must admit, I never heard of these three uprisings until I took a world history course as an undergraduate with one of my mentors from Kane University, the late Dr. Martin Jerome Siegel. He had lived in Russia in the People to People program in the late 50s and had heard this story from the grandchildren of original players. All right. What happened? The most important of the central powers, Imperial Germany, the so-called Second Reich, sought to actively undermine unity among its allied opponents, which at that time were the French Republic and the Russian and British empires. The Germans sought to to support discontented groups within these three rival nations. It's very important to realize that the frustration within the allied nations did not come about overnight. Circumstances varied within each nation, and it's important that difficulties be briefly examined. Now, this is at the height of the British Empire. So the British had conquered 40% of the world through a combination of alliances with local people and military power. In the same time frame in the 19th century, the Russians had created their empire in the East with their quasi-religious ties with both Slavic culture and the Orthodox Church. The French had taken a different approach, and they had won the loyalty of their African colonies in Tunisia and Algeria, through what it called the Mission Civil Trust, the civilizing mission, which provided well-paying jobs, education, and the opportunity for Africans to ultimately become French citizens. But all was not well. Nations who create colonial empires more often than not alienate their subjects. The UK and Ireland they had become increasingly alienated for centuries because of religious and cultural differences. The absolute monarchy of the Russian Tsar, dealing with the chaos caused by overly rapid industrialization and the aftermath of the 1905 uprising, had created both an underused bourgeoisie and a large class of impoverished workers. France had cultural differences between a rural, largely Catholic population who desired a simple, locally-based life in contrast to urban workers who supported a more eh, modern society. The world the workers wanted was represented by the Third French Republic also known as the, in English, the Republic of Pals, France's societal tensions were more subtle, but no less real than the British and Russian situations. The French frustrations with this rural city conflict led to the creation of two separatist movements in Breton and Brittany. Germany would make use of the discontented Irish, Russian, and French on an unheard-of scale. Is that not right? Absolutely. 
the entire German leadership was involved. Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Chancellor, Theobald Holweg, the two great foreign ministers, Gottlieb von Jäger and Arthur Zimmermann, and they were all prime movers of these plans. They all worked it out together. Every leader played a different but very important role in supporting these uprisings in Europe for different reasons. The Kaiser was a brilliant, if somewhat erratic emperor, and he felt passionately that German colonial claims in, in Africa had been ignored. He also had a personal grudge with his two cousins, King Edward VII of the UK and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, because they had not taken his proposal for a German-British-Russian alliance seriously. Now, Foreign Minister Zimmerman sought to weaken the United States in general, even before they got into the war, trying to get a German alliance with Mexico. He created what's known as, in American history as the Zimmerman Note, which is a proposal for Mexico to take back Texas, Arizona, and California. Now, Chancellor Holweg was a master strategist. He wanted to split off Finland, that was then a Russian colony, and create a satellite kingdom. You want to look at see our Political Deals with the Devil podcast to learn more about Finland's role in world affairs. He also wanted to promote Polish, and here's a surprise, Ukrainian independence as satellite kingdoms under German hegemony. Mm. Poland's freedom would come about at the end of the First World War. It would last at least until World War II. Sadly, Ukraine is still struggling to maintain independence today. We see this conflict with Russia and particularly, I don't think it's with the Russian people, but I think it's with Putin. Anyhow, Gottlieb wanted to break the political power of the Russian Orthodox Church. So he persuaded the imperial foreign ministry to support the anti-Christian, atheistic communists under Lenin and Trotsky. How these vastly different movements on the other side of Europe came together or come together uh, to make their bargain is a story in itself. The Russians needed someone familiar with their cause, yet respectable enough to gain entry into the halls of high finance and the Kaiser's court simultaneously. Unfortunately, for the world, they found someone in Israel Zalrich Galfan, known as Alexander Parfus, the demon of revolution. That's what they called him, I guess. There is a great mini-series about his life on Amazon Prime. Uh, Prime, you, you should check it out. Par Parfus is an amazing character. He gets Tolstoy's grandson drunk. He shares a mistress with both Lenin and the great writer Maxim Gorky. And he's called before the Central Committee of the Communist Party, then called the Bolsheviks, for refusing to pay his party dues after his propagandist play, A New World, took off. He had a dramatic fallout with both the communists and his German masters in 1912. But three years later, circumstances had changed. Our Parfus is given an audience first with the chancellor and then with the Kaiser himself. And he obtains 10 million gold German marks, that's $127 million in today's money, to give to the Russian Communist Party. This finances a number of arms purchases, as well as a contract that was put out to murder Russian Prime Minister Petor Solipten, the only man who could have save the Tsar's throne. So Lipton was a brilliant reformer who combined very harsh me methods, life imprisonment, and so on against extremists and terrorists with a strong commitment to economic reforms. He is murdered at, at the opera by a disgruntled agent of the Okrana, the secret police, who was having an affair with Parvis's cousin, who was a prostitute in the pay of the Germans. When World War I begins in September of 1914, absolute chaos also begins. When Tsar Nicholas 
took personal command of Russian forces in late 1915, the German leadership started massive weapons shipments to the communists against the legal legislature, the state Duma. Massive inflation exacerbated economic hardship and polarization. In February of 1917, the Tsar was overthrown and replaced by the Democratic Provisional Government, the first free society in Russian history, had to allow extremists of all sorts their right to speak. The strong-willed and well-financed communists took advantage of the new freedoms to destroy democratic society. Parvis persuaded the German government to finance the return of Lenin and his cohorts to Russia in the so-called sealed train. Catherine Martindale wrote a brilliant book, uh, Lenin on the Train, as the title of it, uh, which details his secular pilgrimage back to the motherland. These prime movers of a movement that would conquer half the world behaved like teenagers on spring break, arguing over seats, smuggling in liquor and cigars and uh, basically screwing anything that they could find. It always surprises me. I'm naive to think that great leaders or even great tyrants have ordinary human desires and experiences. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is in chaos over the war. Ireland is very strongly divided. Many Irishmen and women, Catholic and Protestant alike, responded to the call to make the world, and the slogan of that era, safe for democracy. Thousands served in the British Army. There had been a compromise movement on the issue of independence, which was known as Home Rule, in which Ireland would have increased representation in the United Kingdom Parliament and its own elected national council. But the leaders of what would become the IRA, Michael Collins, Patrick Pierce, and Edmund de Valera, had their own different ideas. Mm -hmm. The German military quickly developed a plan. Commander-in-Chief and future President Paul von Hindenburg quickly contacted prospective allies through the political arm of the Irish movement. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, James Connolly, director of external affairs and future martyr of the 1916 Easter Rising, connected with his best friend, former British diplomat, diplomat and gay activist, Sir Roger Casement. Casement's lover was on the payroll of German intelligence. In August 1914, at the outbreak of World War I, Casement and John Devoy arranged a meeting in New York with the Western Hemisphere's top-ranking German diplomat, Count Bernstorff, to propose a mutually beneficial plan. If Germany would sell guns to the Irish revolutionaries and provide military leaders, the Irish would revolt against England, diverting troops and attention from the war with Germany. Bernstorff appeared sympathetic. Casement and de Bois sent an envoy. Clandigay President John Kinney was the envoy they sent, uh, ostensibly present their plan personally. Kinney, while unable to meet the German emperor, did receive a warm reception from the German ambassador to Italy, Hans von Flotto and from Prince von Bülow. In the early hours of April 21st, 1916, three days before the Easter Rising began, a German submarine put Casement ashore at Banana Strand in Traley Bay in County Carrick. The ship used is now in the Imperial War Museum in London. Suffering from a severe recurrence of malaria that had plagued him since his days in the Congo, and too weak to travel, Caseman was discovered by a sergeant of the Royal Irish Constabulary at McKenna's Fort, an ancient ring fort 
suffering from a recurrence of the malaria that had plagued him since his days in the Congo, and too weak to travel, Kaysman was discovered by a sergeant of the Royal Irish Constabulary at McKenna's Fort. This was an ancient ring fort in Rohain County in Adford, which is now renamed Casement's Fort. They arrested Casement on charges of high treason, sabotage, and espionage against the Crown. He sent word to Dublin complaining about the inadequate German assistance. The Kerry Brigade of the Irish Volunteers, then in Mayo, might have tried to rescue him over the next three days, but its leadership was ordered by Dublin that not a shot was to be fired in Ireland before the Easter Rising was in place, and therefore Dublin ordered the brigade to do nothing. A subsequent internal inquiry attached no blame whatsoever to the local volunteers for failing to attempt a rescue. Casement was taken to Brixton Prison to be placed under special observation for fear he would attempt suicide. There was no staff at the Tower of London where treason committers were normally held to guard suicidal cases. Casement's trial opened at the Royal Courts of Justice on June 26, 1916, before Viscount Reading, the Lord Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Harold Avery, and Mr. Justice Horridge. The prosecution had severe trouble arguing its case. Casement's crimes had been carried out in Germany, and the Treason Act of 1351 seemed to apply only to activities carried out on English soil. A closer reading of the act allowed for a broader interpretation. The court, there was no jury, decided that a comma should be read into the unpunctuated original Norman, then French text, cru crucially altering the sense so that in the realm or elsewhere, referred to wherever acts were done and not just to where the king's enemies might be. Afterward, Kaysman wrote sarcastically that he was to be hanged on a comma, leading to his well-used epigram. A contingent under Sean Connolly occupied Dublin City Hall and adjacent buildings. They attempted to seize nor neighboring Dublin Castle, the heart of British rule in Ireland. The rebels overpowered the soldiers in the guardroom, but failed to press further. The British Army's chief intelligence officer, Major Ivan Price, fired on the rebels, while the Undersecretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, helped shut the castle gates. Unbeknownst to the rebels, the castle was lightly guarded and could have been taken with ease. The rebels in instead laid siege to the castle from City Hall. Fierce fighting erupted. Soon thereafter, British reinforcements arrived. <laughs> By the following morning, British forces had recaptured City Hall and taken the rebels prisoner. The rising caught the British military totally unprepared, and their response on the first day was generally uncoordinated. Two squadrons of British cavalry were sent to investigate what was happening. They took fire in casualties from rebel forces at the GPO, which is General Post Office, and at the Four Courts, a tavern where the rebels were headquartered. As one troop passed the Nelson's Pillar statue, the rebels opened fire from the GPO, killing three cavalrymen and two horses, and fatally wounding a fourth man. The Cavalry retreated to their barracks. On Mont Street, a group of volunteer training corps men stumbled upon the rebel position. Four of them men were killed before they reached Beggar's Rush barracks. As an example of magnanimity, um, most common soldiers involved in the Easter Rising were either amnestied or sentenced to short prison terms. 
the two main leaders, Patrick Pierce and James Connolly, were executed. Edmund de, de Valera received clemency at the time due to possessing American citizenship on his mother's side. But the Easter Rising would start a five-year-long civil war, which would lead to Ireland's partition. Now we have to look at the French situation. And Marshal Philip Pétain, today remembered only sadly as the half-senile head of the Nazi puppet French regime in Vichy during World War II, was actually a great hero a quarter of a century earlier. In 1917, this man had literally saved the French Republic. By that fateful year, the French military was decimated and exhausted. Having saved France from invasion at the First Battle of the Marne in 1914, and then liberated northern Belgium at an agonizing cost in the Battle of Press, which is known to English speakers as Flanders Field in the famous poem a year later. These victories cost 325,000 dead people and over 100,000 wounded soldiers. 58,000 soldiers were captured in these two battles. That is the entire casualty rate for the 12 year long Vietnam War was captured in two battles in this First World War. Think about that, folks. By 1917, over a million people had died, 250,000 had been wounded, and more than 100,000 had been captured. French society was on the verge of collapse. Even the brilliant French offensive, which led to a victory at Verdun, couldn't raise morale. The Germans were determined to exploit rising societal discontentment. Crown Prince Wilhelm himself took charge of a special psychological warfare unit designed to pers persuade French soldiers to defect. 10,000 cavalry and infantry troops were captured in one battle in April 1917, the so-called Second Battle of the Assane. And the failure of the tank offensive in that next battle led to another 4,000 prisoners being captured. Now, 1,500 of these prisoners defect and create the so-called Brittany Liberation Corps, which sought to split off Brittany, a northern French territory, from the Republic and to create a kingdom under a French aristocrat, the Bourbon dynasty. It was clear to Marshal Ferdinand Foch, the French commander-in-chief, and Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, something had to be done. The hero of Verdun was the only possible solution to calm old school Catholic aristocrats and trade union organizers alike. The frustration of the moment had to be prevented from turning into a full scale collapse and mutiny. Philip Pétain seemed to be the only man who could prevent it. This great warrior made his way to the front. Oh, you make it sound like a mini series. And yeah, in reality, I suppose in many ways it is. So just what did this general do? Well, he used a combination of carrot and stick to persuade common soldiers that it was in their interest to remain loyal to their fatherland. The carrot was a promise of more frequent and longer leaves. These men had been in trenches for more than a year. The marshal improved rations by smuggling in gourmet chefs. They cook five course meals for the troops, no sea rations there, complete with multiple desserts and wine. The rumor is a number of hookers came along for the ride also. The French created official brothels to keep their soldiers happy. But the vast majority of ordinary soldiers who would engage in mutinous activity were let off with a few lectures. Higher level officers, if they refused to sign a loyalty oath, forfeited a week's pay. Three captains suspected of rallying troops to defect were given dishonorable discharges. There were actually 3,200 court-martials of so-called Brittany defectors. 71 soldiers were sentenced to death. Thir 40 of those sentences were actually carried out as an absolute last resort. After the war, many of the officers of this, the Brittany Corps fought against the communists in Russia with the so-called White Volunteer Army of Anton Dekin, the great Russian general, during the five-year Russian Civil War. So... Having looked at these 
uh, uprisings, which, which could have dramatically transformed history. What lessons were learned? Well, I think we learned, and we've learned this ourselves, Dr. Weaver, through the 55 wonderful podcasts we've done. History has interpretations, points of view, uh, analysis of all kinds. In the USA, as I said before, we tend to teach and learn history entirely from the American perspective, and, and that's not, not always the best thing to do. We tend to think the rest of the world all, always wishes to be like us, perhaps politically, but in other areas, absolutely not. And frankly, I was very unaware of the intricacies involved in these intrigues, and I'm, I was blessed with Dr. Siegel, God rest his soul, encouraging me to study these things from other viewpoints and try to be more broad-minded about it. Okay, okay. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this this podcast, and I hope that you'll give us a like, make a comment if you wish, and certainly stay tuned for some other pretty wonderful things that are coming up. And we've got a surprise that is going to be a little shocking to people. I'm not going to tell you what just yet until we have it kind of sewed up. But trust me, it will not be anything that you would have expected from us. And so you need to stay tuned. If you, if you click that reminder bell, you'll be made aware when we have another uh, podcast coming up. He's right, folks. I gave my word I wouldn't tell, so I won't. But it's something you'll absolutely love. So, so long for now. <laughs>